Well, over the last few days, there are many countries around the world that have been celebrating the end of 2020. 2020 certainly has been a year to remember. So many people will have said, what a year it has been. And so many have had great cause to rejoice that 2020 is finally coming to an end. They've rejoiced more than they maybe have rejoiced in other years. They can't wait to see it past. They can't wait to forget about it. And they can't wait to get into the year ahead. You know, it has been a, a tough year for many this year. At the beginning of last year, this time, uh, so many of us were maybe making plans and planning what was to come. Certainly I was. I was planning for a wedding. I was planning to hopefully, finally finish Bible college. And so many of you, certainly, were making so many plans and had so many expectations for the year ahead. Of course, we all know very well what happened. We began to hear word of a new virus that had originated in China. And eventually news came that this virus had reached our shores. No doubt there were mixed emotions among many people. And I was one of these people who maybe thought, well, things won't get that bad This will pass over, and this will be something that we will forget about sooner or later, and we'll just continue on with our lives as normal. And yet it seemed to be that the situation got worse, and I remember this date very, very well. March 23rd of last year, we were officially put into lockdown, and we were told to stay at home. This meant many different things for different people, and I ask you this morning, Uh, What did this mean to you? As this news broke out in the news, what did you say in your heart? What was your reaction? What was then your expectation for the year ahead? Maybe it caused you much mental distress. Maybe you thought of the implications of you being in your home every single day. You realized that you were no longer going to get out to the house of God anymore for the foreseeable future. Maybe you were scared of getting this virus itself. Maybe you were fearful for family members. Maybe your mind was full of so many different distresses. Maybe this virus and the implications of this lockdown have hit you hard financially. You're just about getting by. You're wondering about the future. You're worried. Maybe it affected you spiritually because you took your eyes off the Lord. You weren't coming to the house of God anymore and you got settled into this routine of just sitting at home. And when the services were online, when they were being broadcast out, you watched it, you switched in, you switched out, you weren't where you once were with the Lord anymore. And maybe this routine has settled into your life. You're not as consistent anymore. Maybe you could be in the house of God today, but you're listening in online at home and you don't have a legitimate excuse to be home. You should really be here. This virus, this lockdown has affected you and you've taken your eyes off the Lord. Here is a question I would ask every believer this morning, despite all of these things, despite how Uh, The happenings of 2020 have affected you. Have you looked to the Lord? And have you been able to say in your heart, the Lord has had a good purpose in it all? We can look back and we can think of all of the bad things, and yet we forget so often to count our blessings. We forget so often to look back and see what the Lord has done. We have not seen his hand in it all because we have not been searching for the hand of the Lord. We have not blessed his name for all the good that he has done for us in this year that has gone past. And we have then had a wrong view of God's ultimate purpose. God has an ultimate purpose for his church. We see it here in Romans chapter 8, verse 28 to 29. The Lord has this purpose of redemption that is tied to the Lord Jesus Christ himself. And when we get our eyes off this, we can be so worldly minded that that we forget the Lord is working and the Lord is progressing this purpose that as every second goes by, we are near to that great end that the Lord has for us. If I were to come to you in 2020 
In the midst of your great affliction, and I said, Child of God, the Lord has a purpose. This is for good. How would you have reacted? Would have been a reaction of confusion. A reaction of doubt. You look to the Lord and you maybe said in your heart, There is no good in this whatsoever. It's so easy to get like that by circumstances. And I say to you, God's purpose must always be in view, that purpose that he has in Jesus Christ. And we have begun 2021 much like we began or we lived in the year or last year. We began the year in lockdown again. And again, we're back to where we were. It feels almost that rather than things having improved, things have gotten worse and things are getting worse again and we're unsure again about the future. We don't know what's round the corner. We don't know, are we ever going to get out of this any time soon? But I tell you, dear believer, rather than being in despair, you ought to be in great hope this morning. You ought to be in great joy because when we understand God's great purpose, this gives us hope for 2021. God's purpose then is good news. For the year that is ahead. That's what I want to speak about this morning. As we do consider these words in our text in Romans Romans 8, verse 28 to 29. God's purpose, good news for 2021. God's purpose, good news for 2021. The first thing I want you to see with regard to this is that God's purpose is a purpose assured for a particular people. It's a purpose assured for a particular people people. This purpose of God, this good purpose centers around his people. Notice what it says in verse 28 of our text, and we know that all things work together for good to them that love God. This has a believer in view, them that love God, to them who are called according to his purpose. Notice the exclusive nature of what the Lord is saying. Uh, This good, this purpose that he has for his people is for those that love God and are called according to that purpose. We are described here as a people that love God. We are described as a people who have been called by God into His purpose, or according to His purpose. And we could very easily say then, as we consider this here verse, that we love God because God has been pleased to call us. This call spoken of is the call of God in to salvation or unto salvation, the person is called and they are brought into union with the Savior and they trust Him and they begin to love Him. This is the call that always results in the salvation of a person. Now I think of Romans chapter 1 and verse 5 and it speaks there about faith among the nations. As speaking about a people who know the Lord Jesus Christ and there Paul takes it further when he says in verse 6 of Romans 1, among whom are ye also called of Jesus Christ. So he's saying here that the people he was speaking to in the book of Romans are the called of Jesus Christ. That is the called of the nations unto faith. So we see then that this call always leads to faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. So God has taken you in your life. When you were dead in sins and in trespasses, He's taken you and He has called you and He's called you according to His purpose. And now you are on that path to realize God's ultimate purpose, His redemptive purpose in Jesus Christ. What good news that is. It's good news for you this morning. You're at the center of the Lord's will. He has His hand upon you in this world. And you're on the path that he wills you to be on because he has called you by his grace unto salvation. And because of this call, you love the Lord. That was true. He's called you out of your sin, given you a new heart, and therefore you love him in simple love and in gratitude. This love for God is something that has come to your heart. It's a clear demonstration of his favor towards you. And I want to really bring that thought home. And I really want you to understand this this morning, dear believer, lest you be discouraged. God's call to you shows his favor. But here is another thing. As I've said, I want to emphasize it. Your love for God is a clear demonstration 
of his favor towards you. In your unsaved state, you're incapable of loving God. You could not love him. You would not love him. And yet the fact that you love him now shows his love, his grace, his favor to you. And that is so important because so often we can look for God's favor in circumstances. We can look at our circumstances and we can imagine that we're not uh, favorable to the Lord at this present time. We can look at our circumstances and our, the events that come into our lives and we can maybe imagine that the Lord is against us. We can maybe imagine that the Lord is not pleased with us. We can sometimes even imagine that the Lord is chastising us. And we can get all of these things into our head, but yet the Bible does not declare this. It declares that someone who loves God clearly is in the Lord's favor. Now, I'm not saying that the Lord can't give you favorable circumstances, and I'm not saying that the Lord cannot chastise you. But I'm saying to you, you don't look exclusively at circumstances to see where you stand with God. Because if you did that last year, well, so many of us could look and say, well, I was sick or I was in awful circumstances last year with the whole pandemic, and therefore the Lord was against me. Yet that is not the case. And this is important to emphasize in our modern times. There are some that would advocate the possession of circumstances dictate your relationship with the Lord. There are those that advocate prosperity theology. And this is the claim that financial blessing and physical well-being are always the will of God for Christians. So they say, if you have faith in God and you're saved, you will be prosperous, you will be rich, you will not get sick, everything will be all right and everything will be all well. And can you see the problem with this? Someone will come to you in the midst of your sorrow, your grief and all of this, and the fact that you're not financially prosperous, and they'll say, you lack faith. And they'll say, you lack faith because of your sin, and therefore when someone isn't rich, when someone is in the midst of a trial, they're in absolute despair because they're looking at their lives and they're looking for an answer and they're thinking to themselves, I'm not living my life right. My faith is weak. And they think their relationship with God isn't right. And then you imagine those people and they are prosperous because the Lord has put his hand upon them. Yet when the trial comes, when the fall comes, they fall so far away from God because that optimism is taken away. And they imagine again that something is wrong. The Bible is absolutely clear that believers will inevitably suffer. They will go through trials. They will share in the afflictions of the Lord Jesus Christ, the perfect man. And he went through suffering. And he had to face many circumstances in his life, as we know. So I say to you, believer, this morning your circumstances don't dictate the favor of God to you. Your circumstances don't dictate anything like this. But the fact that you love God shows that he favors you. Shows that he loves you. Shows that he delights in you. Maybe that was your problem last year. That caused you to go uh, a wrong path. You imagined that your circumstances were an indication of your life before the Lord. And your trials, you were caused to suffer. And you got it into your mind that something was wrong. You got it into your mind that there was an error of your life that was not correct before the Lord. You ask those questions, why am I suffering? Why am I in the midst of trial? You've been faithful, you've been growing in Christ. You're asking these questions. Well, I say to you, it's simply because it was the will of God. And the Lord has his hand upon you for good. And those sufferings that come into your life are his will. But this does not teach us then the necessity of ensuring that not only do we continue to love the Lord in our circumstances, that our love also remains and grows. The Savior makes an exhortation in Matthew 22, verse 37. Jesus saith unto him, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart and with all thy soul and with all thy mind. And this is the sum and substance of of our faith and our duty to God to love Him with everything we have in our hearts and our minds, to love the Lord, to have a singular view for Him in every single circumstance of our life. And when we love Him, we begin to know Him more. And the more we know Him, the more we know of His wisdom, of His grace, of His power, 
of his great sovereignty. The more we know the Lord, the more we will know his ways. And the more then we will delight in the circumstances that we're in. Matthew Henry says that it is our love to God that makes every providence sweet and therefore profitable. Those that love God make the best of all he does and take it all in good part. Your reaction to circumstances can give an indication of your relationship with the Lord. Not the circumstances themselves, but your reaction to them. Because when you love the Lord, you will be a meek Christian. You will submit to his will. You will see his wisdom. And you will know he has his hand upon you for good. I ask you then this year, how will you react if things get bad? Will your love for God diminish? Will it decrease? Or will your love for the Lord grow as you know that he is outworking his plan? And he is doing everything for that great ultimate purpose in the Lord Jesus Christ. I exhort you, love the Lord more and more. Know the sweetness of trusting in him. And know, most of all, this year, when you're sincere, when you love the Lord, when you walk in his grace, his favor is upon you in the midst of any circumstance. Second thing I want you to think about when we're thinking of this purpose is this purpose is a purpose with a great end. Verse 28, it speaks about Christians who are called according to his purpose. And as we look at that, we wonder, well, what is that purpose? When we go to verse number 29, we see what the purpose of God is, and we get it in our view. In verse 29, it says, For whom he did foreknow, he also did predestinate to be conformed. And this is the purpose of God, to be conformed to the image of his Son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. So often as Christians and as human beings, we would love to be able to see or tell the future. That would be a wonderful thing, wouldn't it? We would love to be able to see the path that we are eventually going to take. And I'm sure many of you would love to know what way you're going to go in 2021. We would love to be able to prepare for the circumstances that will befall us. And yet so often we forget about the Bible. And we forget about what the Bible says with regard to the future. I know there's much confusion about so many things. But here we see in verse 29, there is this great and this certain future for the children of God. And this shows the end that the Lord has for us. This shows his good purpose. It shows that the future of each and every single Christian here today is a future full of grace, goodness, and glory. Verse 29 shows us that very clearly. So you'll notice here what this birch is teaching us. It's teaching us that the very end of God's great purpose, the ultimate of God's great purpose, do not miss this, is that we would be like the Lord Jesus Christ. That's his purpose, that we would be like the Savior. And this here word, or this here verse in verse 29, speaks of being conformed to his image. That word conformed has the thought of being fashioned like unto And we see an illustration of that in Philippians 3, verse 21, what it means to be conformed to the image of Christ. It says in Philippians 3, 21, who shall change our vile body that it might be fashioned like unto his glorious body. That's what it is to be ultimately like the Savior. It is this wonderful transformation that will take place in history when we shall be like Jesus Christ, literally, We shall be transformed into his very image. This will be a a glorious transformation. And notice what verse 29 says. It is the conformity into the image of his Son. It brings the second person of the Trinity into view here. And the idea of this is that the Son of God, who is the one who became flesh, glorified our humanity. He took it out of its sin. And he exalted it into a wonderful glory, a body without sin, a body that will know no more sorrow. This is a wonderful truth. This is God's purpose for you, to transform you, to be like Jesus Christ. That's what's going to happen one day. Your body, your vile body, as the scripture says, will be transformed and fashioned like unto his glorious body. A body where there will be no more sickness. A body where there will be no more sin, no more doubt. 
We'll have to worry about 2021 or any year ahead because we will be in the great eternity sooner or later. But we shall be like the Lord Jesus Christ. What a wonderful work he has done. Verse 29 describes it here as him being the firstborn among many brethren. What that simply means is he is the first to rise from the dead. He is the first to be transformed. And as we see this, then he is the firstborn among many who shall be like him, who shall be his brethren. What a wonderful truth that is then for you this morning. That's a wonderful hope to set before you. You don't know what's going to happen this year but you know what's going to happen in the future. And you know what the Lord is going to do. And that says then God's eternal purpose for you and Jesus Christ. Look at the way it's described in verse 29. Uh, When we think of God's eternal purpose, we're thinking of the fact that God had this purpose before the world began. It says in this verse, in verse 29, for whom he did foreknow, he also did predestinate to be conformed to the image of his Son. And this here word for no has the thought of for love. Every time you read the word no in the New Testament, it has the thought of a delight or an affection or a love for something. So the Bible here is saying here that the Lord foreknows us. It means that he has set his delight and his love upon us. You might ask the question, well, why did the Lord love me? I can't answer that. We know what the Bible tells us. The Lord loved us simply because he loved us. He delighted in us simply because he delighted in us. It's not because he saw something in us. It's not because he saw that we would love him. The Bible simply says he loved us. And as he loved us, he predestinated us. That simply means then that he chose us unto salvation in Jesus Christ. What a wonderful truth. The Lord could have left us in our sin. Could have let us go our own way, and if we had went our own way, we would have been lost. You imagine being in your sinful state at this moment in time. Can you imagine not knowing the Savior? Can you imagine that you had no purpose whatsoever in Jesus Christ? 2021 would be a year of fear and hopelessness and despair. Can you imagine that? And yet the Lord has loved you and chosen you and put you on the road to this wonderful destiny, this glorious destiny in Jesus Christ. This is the path that you are on. Now he's exhort you then, with the year that comes, get this in your view. Don't forget about it. Meditate upon it. Set your mind in the great fact that the Lord has loved you and chosen you unto a wonderful destiny. And we'll put it that way. Meditate upon it every single day. When you do that, what begins to happen? Your heart will be filled with hope. And that will cause you to persevere in the worst of circumstances. Do you realize that no circumstance will take you off this path? Death itself will not take you off this path. Death will take you into a a greater reality and and a sinless expectation of what is to come for the saints of God. You're on this path as the Lord has willed it. You see this wonderful purpose in view. Get your heart upon it. And see that every single day, every hour, every second, you're going closer and closer to your wonderful destiny in Jesus Christ. Titus 2.13 says, Looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior Jesus Christ. That is the wonderful hope. And again, I've said it already with regard to things uh, coming at the end. I don't know too much. Um, about it, but I know this. I know what the Lord's going to do clearly as he has put it before us. This blessed hope set before us. Friend, don't be so worldly minded. Don't think of the hour that you're in. But please consider the future. Can you not see then that you're closer to this great reality and the year ahead? And I say to you and keep on going, keep persevering, looking always for that blessed hope that you will be like the Lord Jesus Christ one day. And you have a great duty as you go into this year because you will be like Christ holy, but you need to be more like Christ in this world. And I ask you, are you more like Christ now than you were this time last year? Will you be more like Christ this time next year? 
than you are this year. To be like the Savior is our great goal in life. It's God's goal, so it ought to be our great goal. That we would be more like the Savior. Determine in your heart this year that no matter what comes, you have a wonderful hope. The world doesn't have it. You have it. And the great end of God's salvation. One more thing I want you to see out of this text is, uh, with regard to God's purpose, it is a purpose advanced in all providences. It is a purpose advanced in all providences. I think it's fair to say that everything that happens in this world is due to the providence of God. The Lord directs, He governs, He upholds all things that happen in this world. Everything that happens, the Lord knows about, and our Lord has ordained as going to come to pass. Psalm 135, verse 6 says, Whatsoever the Lord pleased, that did he in heaven and on earth and the seas and all deep places. You see what happens here. As the Lord is pleased, things have happened in heaven and in earth. And we've spoken already about the great fact that the Lord wants us ultimately to be like the Lord Jesus Christ. But the Lord has not only ordained this purpose, but he has ordained how each and every single one of us will reach that destination. He's ordained the circumstances that will come into our lives. Yes, we go to this one destination. And there are so many similarities we have as we begin to be transformed into the image of Christ in this world. And yet, the path that we are called to travel on will be very different for each and every single one of us. We will all have unique experiences. You've had in your life what you would describe as the good times, the bad times. You've had in your life what you would describe as ups and downs. You think of the ups and you think of those times as prosperity with great joy. And you maybe look at the times where things were difficult and things were trialing to you in great disgrace. And yet all of these things are due to the hand of God. And the Bible goes even further in verse 28 at the very start. It says that all of these things, the good, the bad, the evil, the temptations, were for good. And were good, or God's good purpose. Verse 28 says, and we know that all things work together for good. Notice what Paul says here. He says the word all things. And you see, Paul has this theme in mind. And we see it in verse number 18 of Romans 8. He says, "For this, I reckon that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. And as he moves down here and he's thinking of suffering and glory, he says all things work together for good. And so he's saying even the sufferings that we face, are working together for good. And he asserts here about the Christian, we know that all things work together for good. And I wonder, are you sure of that? Do you have an understanding that all things work together for good? Do you have an understanding that even some of the worst times in your life have come to you by the hand of the Lord? And that He has a purpose in it. In fact, the Lord said, this is a good purpose to bring these things into your life. Maybe you would doubt that. It's so easy to doubt it. You say to me, I love this verse that you're quoting. I love it. It's a verse that brings me comfort, and yet it's so easy to love it and not to live it. Because we think of it and we wonder, well, how can good come out of even some of the things I went through? You ask that question. Well, I say to you, here is the answer. Because, get this into our hearts this morning, the Lord does not cause evil in terms of, the Lord does not make a man or a woman commit evil to another person. The Lord is not the cause of suffering in that he did not bring sin into the world. But here is the thing we understand, when people do evil things, the Lord is able to work and bring good out of it. That's what I want you to understand. If someone does evil to you, the Lord is even able to bring good out of that. Now, we all know very well uh, the story of Joseph. And the verse is so clear in Genesis 50, verse 20, it says, But as for you, ye thought evil against me. And we know Joseph's brothers, uh, they thought evil against him. 
And we know what they did to him. And as we look at all of that, we see that these men committed evil action against their brother. The Lord did not do that. But yet the Lord was working in it. Because it says, but God meant it unto good to bring to pass as it is this day to save much people alive. And that's the wonder of God's grace. If you went to Joseph after his brothers committed such a treachery against him and said, Joseph, the Lord is doing a good thing here. Can you imagine his reaction? In the time and in the circumstances that he was in, he maybe didn't see any good in that at all. As he went on and as there was accusations meant against him, as he went to the present house and you went to him again and said, Joseph, the Lord is doing good here. Again, I'm sure he maybe would have doubted it. And yet when he had his exaltation, when he was brought to that place where he could save his family and his people, and you said it to him, I'm sure Joseph finally understood. The Lord was working in it all. Think of Acts chapter 2, verse 23, the Savior himself. Just to give you another illustration, because this can be um, a hard thought to bring into your minds. Uh, speaks about the Savior, and it says, Him being delivered by the determined counsel and foreknowledge of God. Now this here speaks about the fact that Christ was ordained to be Savior. He was chosen. He is the elect one to die for his people. That was God's will. That's why he was born. And yet look what it says in verse 23 of Acts 2. Ye have taken and by wicked hands have crucified and slain. Now the crucifixion of Christ was an act of injustice. It was murder was not a good event in that regard because the Savior was a just man and he shouldn't have been slain at the cross. It was not a just event with regard to what the men did. But you see how the Lord was working and the Lord of course bought eternal good for his people because as that was as well, it did not free those men from the responsibility of what he did. But we see again, in the midst of evil, the Lord acts and brings good. And we see then how the Lord can work in the lives of his people. In the midst of this pandemic, has the Lord not bought good? I've heard up and down our land, and I know in my home congregation in Port of Ogie, it has been the case. People have been saved through this pandemic. There has been much suffering in it. There has been trial. People have gone through a lot. But look what the Lord has been able to do. He's brought about his purpose and he's advanced it. He saved a people. And is it not true that there have been people, and I'm sure you've heard of this, people have tuned in online. They would never come into this church or come into this building. But they've listened to the word of God online. Is that not good? And I say this with a sensitive heart towards you. Maybe you suffered this year. As I said before, maybe it was financial difficulty. Just about getting by. Just about providing. And there's a constant worry in your heart. Worried are you going to miss the next bill? Worried are you going to have enough money this month? And how can the Lord bring good of that? Well, maybe the Lord has in many special ways provided for you. You've seen his hand upon you. Maybe the Lord wants you to rely more on him, to glorify him more in the provisions that he makes for you. Maybe you're more grateful now than you ever have been of the Lord making a provision. See how the Lord can even work through good and that. Maybe you're in a place of sorrow this year. Your heart was broken. Maybe you've seen your children getting further away from God due to everything that's happening. Because they're doubting God with regard to the pandemic. They're asking why a good God would bring such a thing about. Your children have got further away from God. Maybe it was the death of a loved one. And you wonder what is the Lord doing in the midst of all this. Maybe the Lord is drawing you closer to himself. If your heart breaks, what's one of the first things you do? You look for comfort. You go to the Lord. You cry to him. You look for his grace. You look for his mercy. And you felt his presence like you've never known it before. See how the Lord has brought good out of it. Maybe he just wanted you to be more patient. Persevere in your faith. He's bringing a trial along. He wants to see the sum and substance of your profession as you are put through the mill, if you want to put it that way. The Lord wants to see your Christian patience. He wants to see you persevere. He's strengthening your faith. He's bringing good out of it. Maybe you're in a sinful routine. Think of a young person 
going to places you shouldn't go to, doing things you shouldn't be doing, and the company you shouldn't be keeping. The Lord has put you in your home, giving you time to reflect on what you're doing, showing you that it's wrong, bringing you back to himself. Surely that's good. Brethren and sisters, there are so many ways I could speak of how the Lord in the midst of evil can bring out good. He can make us more like the Lord Jesus Christ. And this is why Paul in Philippians 4 and 11 said, Not that I speak in respect of want, for I have learned in whatsoever state I am, therewith to be content. Paul was saying that in the midst of prison. He's in a prison house and he's able to say that he is content. Because Paul knew very well that God had his purpose. His purpose to make him more like Christ. And therefore, no matter what circumstance he was in, he was able to praise God and say that he was content. If things get bad again this year for you, know something that the Lord can bring good out of it. The Lord can make you more like Christ. The Lord can bring you closer to himself. The Lord can overrule the hands of evil. And the Lord can continue to advance you in his purpose. I ask you in the midst of it all, will you be like Paul? Will you be content? Will you be able to say, I know that the Lord is doing something. And I will ever look to him. And I will trust in his grace. We've seen it this morning, God's great purpose. His purpose for you. His purpose for you to be like Christ. His purpose that will come to pass through his providence. His purpose that gives you hope for 2021. I pray that will be the case for Jesus' sake. Amen. Amen. Let us bow in prayer. And we will ask the Lord to bless us. And as I always say when I'm on the pulpit at the end of a service, I will be remaining here after the service. Um, if you will, would like to speak to me, then please do make that known. If there's anything you'd like to speak about, I will be here. And of course, we will do that in a manner that is safe. Um, but we'll seek the Lord now and we'll ask that he will bless us as we part one from the other. Our Father, under God in heaven, we thank thee for thy grace and for thy hand upon us this year. I pray, Lord, that you'll continue to bless us, you'll continue to be with us. We thank thee that thy presence will be with us now and for all eternity. Help us, Lord, no matter what comes this year, to always look to thee, to always trust in thee, and to know that you are working all things for good, to the end that we will be like the Savior. Undertake for us now, bless thy people here, encourage them this day. May they know the Lord's comfort and blessing. We do think of those that have been bereaved recently. May they know especially the Lord touching them and putting his hand upon them. And may they know the comfort of the Holy Ghost. But part us now with thy fear and with thy mercy. Take us to your homes in safety. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.